Hey you guys, welcome back. So we're going to go ahead and go into our next lesson, which is the level M of the math course. And it's lesson two, which is about fractions, uh, rates, and ratios. So let's go ahead and get started. The first thing we're gonna talk about is multiplying and dividing fractions. Um, so we start with this rather than addition and subtraction because the multiplying and dividing concepts um, are, are actually easier. There's less rules. You just basically go across, straight straight across the top and the bottom of the fractions um, and multiply. So um, one way we can sort of connect this to what we were doing previously um, is to think about, let's talk about geometry, right? So like one of the things we went over was the area of a rectangle. And rectangle area can be found by multiplying the length times the width. So if we were to draw a rectangle, okay, here's a rectangle. We would find the whole area, like of all the space inside of this rectangle by multiplying the length times the width, okay, or the base times the height, however you wanna think about that. Um, and that's pretty easy when you have whole numbers for your dimensions, right? So like, if your dimensions were like two, the length is two and the width is one, it's just gonna be two times one and your whole area of this rectangle is gonna be two because two times one is two. Um, but what if you were given the dimensions, the length and the width using fractions? So like, what if the length of this rectangle, I'll, uh, I'll actually write this example down. What if the length of the rectangle was uh, one half of a yard and the width of the rectangle is a quarter of a yard okay so now what you need to do is you still do the same process you still multiply the length times the width but you have it in fractions now um, so you need to multiply those fractions well how do you do that well you take the length half a yard multiplied by the width a quarter of a yard and it's going to give you an answer and the result of that is going to be the area of this rectangle. Um, now how do you multiply fractions? Well it's pretty easy. You actually just multiply the numbers on the top and you multiply the numbers on the bottom and the result will still be a fraction um, but you'll have a new uh, denominator and a new numerator hopefully most of the time. Well, let's go ahead and do this multiplication, right? So across the top, it's gonna to be one times one, and that's gonna give us one. And then the denominator is going to be two times four, which is sixth, one over six. So the new, the area of this rectangle is one sixth of a yard squared. Now don't forget that squared, okay? That's just, that's just a little bit of information from our geometry lesson. This is a two dimensional shape, so we need to express the units of its area using the exponent of two, okay? Um, so now let's take the, you know, the context out. Let's just forget about the area and the length and width and all that. Let's just multiply and divide some fractions so you can practice with this. So the first thing that you will do, and this is this first example over here. Okay, so I just realized on the screen, by the way, that you can't see anything I drew, so sorry. Let me just roll that over real quick. So you can see that we found the area of that rectangle to be one over six yards squared, okay? Um, sorry about that. I'm gonna try to be a little more cognizant of that as we go forward. So let's work on these two examples, uh, these four examples, rather. The first two are multiplication. The second two are division. The first one is five-eighths times five-ninths. And so what we can do is just multiply across the top and multiply across the bottom. So multiply, multiply. And this is gonna give us a new fraction. On the top, we have five times five, which is 25. And on the bottom, we're gonna have nine times nine, which is 72. Okay, now that's the answer. The answer is 25 over 72. The, the only thing that might make this very slightly complicated is that most of the time when you have these, these problems with these fractions, you're going to have to um, simplify the fraction or reduce the fraction into its smallest terms. So what you're looking for here is you're looking for a number that goes into 72 and also goes into 25. So we might be looking for something like 
5 because I know 5 goes into 25. It, it doesn't really go into 72 though. We might try something larger than that. Okay, so looking at this problem, um, there actually, there isn't anything that goes into 25 and 72. It's actually as reduced as it can go. It doesn't go any further than that. So you're just going to leave the answer just like this and that's it. That's all you can do. Um, okay, so next example is another multiplication and I want you to go ahead and pause the video and I'm going to put a little star next to this so you know this is one that I want you to try. So go ahead and give that one a shot. Okay, so hopefully you give it in a try and we know our answer is going to be another fraction. We need to do the numerator first, which is 8 times 9 and then we do the denominator, which is 9 times 4. Well, 8 times 9 is 72 and 9 times 4 is 36. So this is actually curious because in this example we ended up with an improper fraction. Remember a fraction represents parts of a whole so what this is saying is that I have 72 parts of something that is only 36 parts and that doesn't make any sense. For example if I have a pizza that is in 36 pieces I, I could have 72 pieces, but that would mean that I have more than one pizza, right? So another thing you can do here is to simplify this is if the numerator is larger than the denominator, just do the division and see if you come out to an e a clean, easy number. Because if you do, then it's simplified. If you don't, if it's like a decimal or something, then you know you need to look for a common, a common factor there. Um, but 72 divided by 36 is actually 2, so the answer here is just 2, okay? Um, yeah, so that's it with the multiplication of fractions. It's pretty easy. You just go across the top and across the bottom. And the next thing we're going to be talking about is going to be dividing fractions. So let me roll this page up a little. So when you have fractions and you are dividing them, right, um, you might be thinking at first, like, how do I even do an operation like that? There's so much going on. There is there is a golden rule with dividing fractions. Okay, so um, golden rule. For dividing fractions. Okay, so this rule that we're talking about is called keep change flip. Okay keep change flip kcf this is how i remind my students of this okay um i i just i tell them kfc like the restaurant and then they associate it with like food and you know then they they've got it so um i would encourage you to do the same associate this with food and there you go so we have kcf that stands for keep change flip okay keep change flip and this is a tool you can use to divide fractions what this means is that you keep the first fraction exactly the same you change nothing about it it is the it's just it stays the same the second thing you do is change the problem from division to multiplication and then the last thing you do is flip the second fraction so let's see one in action so we can we can show how that works so this is our first fraction, it's 1 half divided by 7 fourths. We're going to keep the first fraction. That's going to be 1 half. We're going to leave it exactly the same. Next, we're going to change this problem to be a multiplication problem. So multiply. And then the last thing we're going to do is flip the second fraction. So instead of it being 7 over 4, it's now going to be 4 over 7. You just flip the fraction. And now you have a multiplying fractions problem like we were doing previously. And you can just multiply those straight across the top and straight across the bottom and you'll have an answer. So one times four is four and our denominator is two times seven, which is 14. The only thing that you might do here at the end is just look for a way to simplify this. And I know for a fact that I can divide the top and the bottom numbers by two. So if I do go ahead and simplify that, 4 divided by 2, um, actually I'm going to use a different color for this, so I'm going to do divide by 2 and divide by 2 because if I do something to the top I must also do it to the bottom. So 4 divided by 2 is 2 and then 14 divided by 2 is 7. 
Now, because seven is a prime number, um, I know the only things that go into it are one and seven. And so therefore, I know this fraction is not gonna be able to be reduced any further. Okay, so let's go ahead and mark this second problem here. This one's gonna be for you to try, so give it a shot, pause the video, and then when you come back, we will do it together. Okay, so hopefully you paused and gave it a try. This is a division, so we need to keep change flip. That means we're gonna have two thirds, we keep it the same. Multiplied, that's changing this division problem to a multiplication. And then you flip the second fraction, so that'll be three over two. Now, all you do here is multiply across the top and then multiply across the bottom, and you get six over six. And now the only last step you might have is just to try and simplify that. Well, um, if you have six pieces out of something that is all together made of six pieces, that means you have 100% of it. You have the whole thing. You have all six pieces of the thing that is six pieces. So like, you know, in my quarantine here, I might order a pizza with six slices and then I eat them all because I'm in quarantine and I can't control myself. So um, I have one pizza all to myself or six out of six slices of that pizza. So this really can just be simplified to one and that's it. Okay, so the next topic on here um, is going to be about adding and subtracting fractions. Um, my page got a little messed up. This is actually supposed to be moved down to the next page, but whatever, it's fine. We'll just leave it at the top here. There's a golden rule for adding and subtracting, and that is that you must always have a common denominator. That means the number on the bottom of each fraction that you are adding or subtracting has to be the same. And I'm gonna go ahead and level with you. 99% of the time when you have a problem that's adding or subtracting fractions, it's not gonna be the same. You're gonna to have to do something to it in order to make it the same, and that's what we're gonna be talking about right now. Okay, so let's talk about the first example here. We have 5 fourths plus 5 twelfths. They do not have the same denominator because 4 and 12 are not the same number. Okay, so you need to do something to make them have the same denominator. So I know that if I multiply four times three, then that number will become 12, okay? The trick is I can't just change the denominator, I also have to change the numerator. If you do something to the top, you have to do it to the bottom. If you do something to the bottom, you have to do it to the top. So if I do that, I'm gonna multiply this by three, which means I also have to multiply this by three, now let's rewrite our problem so that we can see it written out, right? That first problem is now gonna become 15 over 12, and we didn't do anything to the second fraction, so this is still gonna be five over 12. But now that they have the same denominator, I can go ahead and do this addition or subtraction. And all I do with addition and subtraction, once I get that common denominator, is I just do the operation at the top. So I'm not gonna add 12 and 12, because that doesn't really make sense. What this is really saying is, let's say we have, let's go back to the pizza analogy, because I just love talking about food. So let's, let's go back to the pizza analogy, right? If a pizza has, um, let's say, okay, I got it. Let's say one pizza has 12 slices cut into it already, and another pizza has four slices cut into it already, okay? If I asked you which pizza has, which which of those pizza pies has more pizza cut out of it, right? Five fourths, is that more? Or is five twelfths more, okay? It's kind of not easy to just compare those two numbers right off the bat. And, yeah, what, and, and something you can do to make it easier to make that comparison would be to make them have the same amount of slices. And then you could count them and say, well, this pizza has this many slices and all the slices are the same width, okay, that's the same units, they're, they're the same um, the same size slices, right? Um, and then this pizza has this many, and then you can compare them. So that's kind of what's happening in an addition or subtraction of fractions problem. You want to get them into a common denominator or units, that way you can do something with the numbers on the top. So right now it looks like I have 15 plus 5 over 12, which would be 20 over 12, now, that's an improper fraction, okay? 
but it's fine. You can you can totally leave it as an improper fraction, okay? The only thing is that you want to see if you can simplify, okay? And I know for a fact that you can simplify this, so I'm making this note. You want to simplify the fraction anytime you can, and that means you're looking for a number that goes into the top and the bottom of that fraction. So our first number is 20, second is 2. They're both even numbers, so I would say dividing both of them by 2 would be probably a good idea. Um, that, would, that would break them down at least one half of the way, and then you could see if there's still a number that goes into it. Let's do that. So, so that would give us 10 over 6 because we're dividing by 2. You'll notice this pattern with me, by the way, that I, I you know, it, instead, of, instead of taking up, my brain only has so much space, right? And yours too. We only have so much room in here to, to store things. So if, there, if there's a way that I've already learned how to do something and I can apply that method and get, you know, an answer to a different problem, then I'm going to do that instead of memorizing yet another procedure or yet another you know way to do something if there's already a way i know how to do something then that's the thing that i'm going to do okay so i totally lost my train of thought because i paused my recording for a second because my cat was like making these loud obnoxious noises so um uh oh yeah back to this problem right got it okay so uh all right i was talking about uh the ways number of ways to do something and how i'm always going to try and do like the least amount of things to remember right so you'll notice whenever i simplify fractions um i'm just gonna like start dividing by two or three maybe like the smallest increments unless it's like a huge fraction then i might do something different but like something like this let me just start with two and see what I end up with, right? So I ended up with 10 over six. I'm not done. I, I know that can simplify, but what I can do is I can divide it by two again. I can just keep doing that until I get it pretty small. And then once I get it pretty small, maybe it'll become clearer to me what the common, uh, do not, uh, least common, the, the factors are that's between these. So if I divide by two again, I get five over three, and I know five and three are both prime numbers, and there's nothing else I can do to make this simplified. So this is our final answer, okay? And I just did that by dividing everything by two repeatedly until I got it as small as I could get it. Okay, um, pause the video, try this question for yourself. Remember, we are looking for it to have a common denominator first. The bottom numbers must be the same. In order for that to happen, you're going to need to do something to one or both of the fractions, okay? And then um, and then you can just do the, the operation on the top or the, the bottom of that, okay? All right, so hopefully you gave that a try, and we're going to, I guess, use purple. Purple's good, right? We're going to try this problem. So 20 and 16. So... <clears throat> I can't just multiply 16 by something um, to get to make it be 20, okay? Because that would be too easy. The last problem was 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 nice and easy for us that way. This one isn't. Um, I could start by going by two, maybe like multiply this whole thing by two, multiply this whole thing by two. Um, here's a good strategy, right? So 20 is going to be 20, 40, 60, 80, 100. Like that's that's the multiples that I can skip count and they all end in zero, right? So is there a way for me to make 16 multiply by something so that it's a number that ends in zero that is also a factor or 20 is a factor, right? So like what's 16 times two? It's 32, that ain't it. What about 16 times four? That's 48. That's not it either, okay? Um, no, it's not, I just lied. 16 times four is 60, uh, 64, my bad. Okay, so so that's not it either. Um, let me keep going, right? So like 16, this is like, this one's, this one's tricky. Like they want you to just keep increasing those numbers, up those numbers. Um, what about, what about 160, right? Like I could divide, um, I could make 20 into 160, easy. I could just multiply that by eight. 
and I can make 16 into 160 by multiplying it by 10. So that might be it. That might be what I have to do here. And that's let's just follow that logic, right? So this one's going to be uh, 8, and this one's going to be 10. But if I do something to the denominator, I also have to replicate that into the numerator. So that means that I need to multiply this times 8 also and this times 10 also. So let's let's make these new fractions, right? So I have 88 over 160. That's a plus. And then we have 30 over 160. And they have a common denominator now. So all I have to do is add the, the numerators. So um, let's see, 8, 9, 10, 11. That's 110 plus 8 is 118. 118 over 160. Now the only the only issue here really is that you know I need to simplify this right because this this is like this is huge, and they're both even numbers so like it, that's an indicator like if if both the numerator and the denominator are even, that usually means that you can break it down pretty much 100 percent of the time. So let's just go by twos like I've been doing. So <clears throat> um, so the denominator is going to be 80, right? And then the numerator, 118 divided by 2, is going to end in 9. So maybe 59? Yeah. 59 over 80. So, I mean, does that break down any more? If it was 60 over 80, yeah, for sure. Um, I'm going to check my calculator and just see maybe if I can do it by like 3s or something. I think 59 might be, 59 might be prime actually. I don't know. 59 divided by 8. 10, 16, hmm, I think 59 is prime, you guys. So if 59 is prime, then that's it. That's all I can do. Um, factors of 80 could include, nope, that's it. 59 is prime. So it doesn't really matter. 59 is prime, and that's going to be the final answer. So that's, that's all you can do, okay? So that one's, that one's done. Okay. Now we also have subtraction of fractions and subtraction of fractions. That's funny. It rhymes. Subtraction of fractions is the same as addition. The process is identical. You need a common denominator and then you need to do the subtraction of the numerators and you'll have an answer. So I'll do one and then you do one. Okay. Um, first problem. This is a cut off for some reason, but I, it should be. 1 over 15 and 11 over 12. Okay, I fixed that just now. So in order for these to have a common denominator, I need to multiply. Um, let's see. I wonder if I multiply by... <laughs> Maybe by 5. 15 times 5 would give me 75. Nope, that's not it. 15 goes into 60 though, that would be four times, and 12 goes into 65 times, so 60 is gonna be our new denominator. So this is going to be 15 times four, and this is also, no, this is times five, 12 times five. So let me erase that so it's a little, a little clearer for you, times five. Okay, so if I do something to the denominator, I must also do it to the numerator, okay? So let's rewrite these brand new fractions this is going to be 4 over 60 minus uh, 55 over 60. Okay, so this is an even better problem now because you have something, you have a smaller quantity first and a larger quantity second that you're taking away from that. So something you're going to have to do here is actually you're going to, you're going to see like negative numbers now. Okay, so stay with me. We'll just, we'll do this together. We'll step by step it, okay? So we have a common denominator. So now we just need to do four minus 55, okay? So if I'm thinking of a number line, right? Here's zero. Let me roll this up so you can see this a little better. Here's zero. Here's positive four, because I counted one, two, three, four. Okay, this is not gonna be to scale, but like negative 55, is all the way over here to the left of zero because if I go this direction, I get negative numbers, okay? So 
another way to look at this too is to look at it like well i want to know the distance between four and 55 like how many um how many units am i gonna have to go well I don't want to count all the way to negative 55 because that would give me 59 units here, 59 tick marks between four and 55. What I want to do is I'm, I'm starting with four of something, okay? Here's, here's a good way to visualize this. You, you have four um, you know, items in your hand. How about apples? Okay, you have four apples and I just start, I start taking them away from you, right? One, two, three, Four. if I take four of them away you have no apples left okay but like what if you know you're gonna get some more apples at some point but I need to just keep taking apples from you and and you can't actually give me any right now because you don't have any left but you're gonna owe me apples right that means you are gonna start having negative apples because as soon as you get more you're not really getting more you're giving them back you're giving them to me you're paying me you know what i'm saying so if i keep counting and i do that 55 times right um then you lose the four that gets you to zero and then you have to keep counting how many more spaces right what's 55 and i and i take away four of those it's 51. so there's 51 51 more spaces right in between here and 51 and 4 makes 55. So that was kind of maybe not the the you know that was kind of a clunky example but but that's basically how how negative numbers work when you're doing like addition and subtraction. So another way to look at this too is is let's say you had negative 55 and you added 4 to it. Okay? So here here's another number line, right? And you're at zero. Ooh, I don't know why it's drawn all the way over here. Hold on. Probably because I zoomed and messed up the document. Okay, uh, erase that and let's make sure you can see this. Looks like you can. Okay, so if this is zero and this is negative 55, I want you to add four to it. And when we add, we're going this direction, right? So one, two, three, four would be negative 51. Okay, that's that's another way to look at adding, you know, adding and subtracting negative numbers. All right, um, all right. So back to our problem, right? So we concluded that this is negative fifty-one over sixty. Now the only thing at this point that you might want to look at is just does fifty-one and sixty have any common factors that you could like sort of break this down? And fifty-one is a prime number, so that's going to be no. It's that's it. And don't forget the answer is negative, so that negative sign is included in the answer. Okay, um, next problem, pretty easy, and it's because you already have a common denominator. So I want you to just do that. You probably can mental math this one and pause your video and we're back. So hopefully you mental math that or wrote it out and nine minus seven would give me two out of 10. And two out of 10 can be simplified because I can divide the top by two and the bottom by two and I get one over five. Final answer for that question. Okay, so that's half of this lecture. That's um, topic one and topic two. We have two more topics. And before we get there, inside the notes, I put this handy like sheet sheet type thing that you can download. Um, and it gives you all the rules for what to do for adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing fractions. So if you're somebody who like really likes to have like cheat sheets for how to, you know, remind yourself to do different things, um, this might be an excellent resource for you to either hand write it out or print it and put it up next to your computer or wherever you do your work at, um, or, you know, however you're taking your notes, save it in your notes so that you can easily come back to it but it, it's a really quick you know like overview of how to do each of these type of problems okay so um, our next topic is going to be about ratios and rates we're actually going to break this down into two things we're going to talk about ratios first 
and then we're going to talk about rates even though they're basically the same thing there is a difference between them um, so if you'd like to now is a great spot for you to go ahead and press that pause button and um, take a bathroom break or grab a snack or something um, and then come back and unpause and we will continue with this lesson okay so our next um, section is going to be about ratios and rates the first part of this we're going to talk about is ratios a ratio is just a way to compare um, when the units of something um, are are the same so like if I'm just comparing the number of one type of object to the number of another type of object that would be a ratio um, because the the thing that is the units here would be the, the count like the number of right um, now if we were talking about something like you know driving a car and we're talking about your speed miles per hour or kilometers per hour that's not a ratio because you're not comparing the uh, the same units okay um, that that would be considered a rate and that's that's the only difference between ratio and rate is is if you're if you have the same units or not so <clears throat> let's talk about ratios um, we'll use this example here of the circles and triangles so it says find the ratio of circles to triangles and what a ratio answers the question that it answers is how many of one thing um, compared to or for every of something else so in this example what we want to look at is we want to answer the question of um, how many circles um, are there for every triangle how many triangles are there for every circle um, so an easy way to look at this is just to count everything and you have two circles and you have four triangles so the ratio here would be two to four for every two circles there are oh i can't count obviously i don't know what i was thinking my bad um there's actually eight triangles i really hope that you saw that and said no there's eight what is this crazy you know bald guy talking about um it's two for every eight sorry so it's two for every eight so for every for every two circles there are eight triangles okay or another way to flip that would be to say for every eight triangles there are two circles and you might be saying aren't you saying the same thing and the answer would be technically yes but it's all in how the question is worded are they asking you for circles to triangles or triangles to circles so there are two circles for every eight triangles and notice this follows the same order of the wording that was in the question so just like before um, with the fractions right you should generally be looking to get that answer in the simplest form possible and so what you want to look for is something that you can divide both of these numbers by that would reduce this to its lowest terms possible so visually this is actually um, a really good example because um, these two rows here so the top row with the one circle and the four triangles and then the second row with the other circle and the other four triangles they're identical and so if i were to just remove half of these shapes and just have the one row left right um, that would give me a ratio of Let's use a different color right that would give me a ratio of one to four okay one circle for every four triangles and that's a visual representation but how do we do that mathematically well what can i divide both sides by i can divide it by two that's my favorite thing to start with is two right so you should try it also if i divide two by two that gives me one and if i divide eight by two that gives me four so that's how I mathematically found that, that simplified version of that ratio. 
Um, let's see. I think in this paragraph, I'm just explaining that's that's how you bring that down, least common multiple. Um, for every one circle, there are four triangles, which means that for every two circles, there are eight triangles. So for every three circles, there are 12 triangles. Um, that's just another way to express those. Those are equivalent ratios. All those things are equal to each other. So one in four is equal to two and eight, which is equal to three and 12. And you could just keep going and going and going, right? Another way to think of that too is if you did another row and counted everything, you'd have three circles compared to 12 triangles. So I hope that makes sense. That's basically the gist of what a ratio is. Um, you're gonna have a U try problem right here. It's, it's a similar type problem. You're just looking for the ratio of triangles to circles, okay? Triangles to circles. So what you wanna do is count everything and go ahead and pause the video, do that, do that problem, count it up, find your ratio, simplify your ratio. Okay, so hopefully you paused and gave it a try. There are nine triangles here and there are, let's see, um, 15 circles. So the ratio here is nine to 15. There's nine triangles to 15 um, circles. And the only other thing we need to do is simplify this ratio. You can look at this problem visually and you can say these three rows are all identical. So what if I div just got rid of these two? I would have three to five. And how can I do this mathematically? So mathematically, if I have nine and 15, I could divide by three on both sides of the ratio. And nine by three is three and 15 by three is five. And these two answers you can see are the same. These are actually equivalent ratios too. Three to five is equivalent to saying nine and 15, okay? Um, and another connection that you might make here is that you might look at this and say, isn't this just like fractions? And the answer is, yeah, it kind of is just like fractions, right? Let's say, for example, I'll use, um, let's do bright green, why not? Um, if, I, if I were to write this as a fraction, it would be nine over 15 or nine out of 15, right? And when I simplify this, I would get three out of five, three for every five, okay? Um, so our next type of problem we might see is a word problem type example. Um, and let me zoom this a little bit. Okay, so let's look at a word problem. The first one is number of Twitter followers. And so in this little table, you can see here that Samuel has 54 followers on Twitter. Lincoln has 63 followers on Twitter and Claire has 45 followers. Okay, so you, you absolutely must read the question and, and determine what is it they're even asking you to find out about this. Um, well, first of all, if the question is, are any of these people very popular, you know, the answer would be absolutely not because these numbers are so small. So it's just a little bit of humor from me to you. I hope you enjoyed that joke. Um, let's read the question. It says, for every blank followers that Claire has, Lincoln has X amount of followers also. So the question is, let's compare Claire and Lincoln. They gave us this information about Samuel that we we don't need. We honestly don't even need it, right? So let's compare Claire's 45 to Lincoln's 63. And I want you to look for, you might think, oh, I can just stop there because for every 45 followers that Claire has, Lincoln has 63. And that's technically true except in ratios we always want to look for that simplified simplified boiled down version right so let's let's try and break this down a little bit i i know for a fact these are both divisible by nine so let's divide this side by nine and this side by nine and this ratio is now going to become five in seven so that means for every five followers that claire has lincoln has seven okay 
That's the most basic version boiled down. That's what we're looking for with these problems. So given that example, um, let me roll this up a little. I want you to go ahead and do this example, which is about books. We have four people in this table and the number of books that they've read in a year. And if you went ahead and extended this table here and you just added me, you can put that at like zero probably because I'm, I'm, I'm a terrible person and I don't read, okay? Like I really just don't have time to read books. I read sometimes, you know, every couple years or something. <laughs> anyway, so um, let's continue with this problem. We're looking for, for every number of books that Aaron read, Elizabeth read, how many? So you need to make a ratio of Aaron's books to Elizabeth's books. So how many is that? Pause the video and give that a shot. Okay, so hopefully you paused and gave it a try. There are 42 books that Aaron has read in a year and Elizabeth has read 36. So what's the ratio here? Let's just do my preferred strategy, which is starting to divide by two. Okay, so this is 21 to, um, oh gosh, what is this? I don't know, 16, 15, 15, 18, so 18, okay. Can this go any further? Let's try two again. And the answer is gonna be no for two because this is an odd number. 21 divided by two does not give me a nice clean number to work with. Let's try something else, how about three? If I divided by three, okay, that would give me seven to six. 18 divided by three is six. So for every seven books that Aaron read, Elizabeth read six, they're, they're pretty close. They're like neck and neck, right? Um, you know, until you start getting to larger and larger numbers, because now the split here is, you know, it's a, it's a wider divide. So pretty interesting observation there with that, that ratio. Okay. Um, our next thing, and we have two more things to go. We're going to talk about rates and then we're going to talk about operations with mixed numbers, which is cake and you're going to love it. Okay. So let's keep going. We're talking about rates now. And when we're talking about rates, we're talking about things that have different units. So like I said in, in the example before, miles per hour or hours per week, you're comparing how many times one thing occurs um, or how many of something you have in comparison to a different measurement or different type of units. So let's do example one. You're driving for two hours at a constant speed. Okay, in real life, does that ever happen? No because you have stop signs, you have bread lights, you know, if you're not using cruise control, if there's, you know, not obstacles in the road, if there's not other cars driving around you that you have to keep slowing and, you know, speeding up and slowing down, it's very rare that you would ever literally have two straight hours of, of driving at a constant speed, right? So, but anyway, for the term, for this, for this problem, for the sake of doing this problem, let's assume it's a constant rate of speed and that is two hours that you're driving. And in those two hours of that constant speed, you have made it 100 miles from your home to 100 miles from here, wherever that is, okay? What was your rate? What was your rate meaning what was your speed, right? The speed is the rate, right? It's the comparison of how many miles you went in those two hours, right? How many miles did you go in two hours, okay? So for every um let's see miles per hour would be miles per hour the the comparison here is a hundred miles in two hours but i don't want to know how far you went in two hours i want to know what your rate is in terms of one hour you want you want the second thing here to be one so how do i make this one i can divide both sides by two divide two divide two this ratio now becomes 50 to one. So 50 miles every one hour. And that's a pretty common standard um, measurement that we use when we're talking about speed. Um, we, we discuss that using miles per hour. You might also see that in like, uh, like the UK and stuff, they, they use kilometers per hour. Go, go ahead and, and look at your car next time, look at your dashboard at that speedometer, 
it's going to have two different measurements on there. It's going to have miles per hour MPH, and it's also going to have KM slash H, which is kilometers per hour. Um, that's because they use the metric system. So any country that uses the metric system um, will have kilometers per hour. That's what you go by. Okay, I digress. Let's move on to the next example. Next example is you earned $120 for working six hours a day for two days. What is your hourly rate of pay? So when we're talking about your hourly rate of pay, we're talking about dollars per hour, okay? That's what we're measuring is dollars per hour. So the first thing you're gonna write is dollars, $120, and then compare that to the hours. Well. You work six hours a day for two days. That's a trick in this question, right? So how many hours did you actually work to make that 120? You worked 12 hours because you did two days of six hours a day. So 12 hours. But I don't want to know what it is that you make every 12 hours. Like, I don't think anyone, you might say like, you're, you might have like an annual salary. You might You might even say like, you know, every paycheck I make about this much money, um, that would be like, you know, every every two weeks or whatever. I rarely ever, I've never, I don't think I've ever heard anyone say, how much money did you make per 12 hours? Like, no one asked that. So you need to know how to be able to say what your hourly rate is, um, you know, and, and, and express that in terms of just one hour. So for me to do that, I need to divide both sides and I'm, I'm gonna run out of space, so I'm gonna try to write this really small. Divide both sides by 12 and I'm doing that because I wanna get 12 to be one. I want it to be one hour. 12 divided by 12 will give me one. So this conversion here will be some amount of dollars per one hour. Well, what's 120 divided by 12? It's 10 because 10 times 12 gives me 120. So $10 per hour. So um, this person's, your hourly rate of pay for this, you know, this amount of time was $10 an hour. And that's the problem. So how could, let's, let's, let's put out, here's my pencil. I'm putting it down. It's out of my hands. Think for a second. Let's just think. How can we apply what we just did with this rate into some real life example? Well, what if you are comparing, um, you know, jobs, right? Like one of the one of the most important reasons we we get a job in life is because we need to earn money somehow to you know pay for our housing and our our bills and our food and all that. And so, if you're looking at different jobs something you might be looking at is the salary and you know let's say you're comparing a job that pays you a salary of fifty thousand dollars a year and another job that pays you by the hour and they pay you thirty dollars an hour okay which one pays more so in order to do that problem you need to have this expressed in the same you need to boil that down to like the same units you either need to take the there's there's more hours in a year than there are in an hour so you need to bump those hours up so that you're talking about the same amount of time meaning meaning one whole year or you need to take the salary and and drop that make it smaller drop that down so that you you have that fifty thousand dollars you know compared to what it comes out to in hours then you can then you can really safely compare those two jobs and say this one pays more or less than this one does. Um, of course, you know that's that's all all other things remaining equal. You know, one job might have you know benefits like health insurance, and you you know the other one doesn't, and so then that might be a sweeter deal for you, even though the hourly pay might be less. You also have health insurance, and that's you know. A, a great benefit to have and that might be more worth it to you to take that job even though it pays a little less or you know one job might give you the opportunity to work overtime and and the overtime pay would make more than than the other job you know um, there's just there's so many things to consider but if you're just talking straight pay you're going to want to get them in the same units dollars per hour or dollars per year and then compare them um, to figure out which one is, is better or worse 
So, okay, that's uh, we're we're unfocusing from that example. We're going back into the notes. We're going to finish wrap this up. The next thing is an example of typing. You are typing for ten minutes straight without stopping. Okay, so um, at the end of the ten minutes, you've written a whole essay with ten thousand. I'm sorry, a thousand words in it. How many words per minute did you type and how many words per second did you type? So this is actually asking you two things, right? They, they want to know two rates here. They want to know your words per minute and your words per second. So let's start working this out. So right now we know we have a rate um, of 1,000 words per 10 minutes. Okay, now to do the words per minute um, rate, that's not that's not hard. That's that's not too bad, right? You just need to make this ten minutes become one minute, and you can do that by dividing it by ten. And if I divide one side by ten, I must divide the other side by ten. And this is going to go ahead and give me one hundred words per one minute. And so your answer would be 100 words per minute. And that's half the battle because we found out one of the answers. The other part of this is words per second, okay? So yes, we could we could start from the beginning, the 1,000 words in 10 minutes, and figure out how many seconds are in 10 minutes and, and do that conversion. That, that's tricky because it's bigger numbers, but I've already broken it down into 100 words for every minute. So can't I just change one minute into seconds and then boil that down to sec one second? I definitely can. So how many seconds are in a minute? 60, right? So if I were to change one minute into 60 seconds, right? That would be 100 words In 60 seconds okay because 60 seconds and a minute are equivalent they're the same thing they're identical so it's still a hundred words because 60 seconds is still a minute but I want to know how many words per one second so for me to find that out I need to divide both sides by 60 to make that 60 seconds become one second and so if I do that I actually need my calculator for this because I can't do that in my head um, 1.67, okay, I don't love that, whatever, it's 1.67. This would be 1.67 words per one second or 1.67 words per second. Let me make sure you can see all that, yeah, you can. So, so that is how you do a problem like that. You need to figure out um, how do you do the conversions? What's the, you know, what's the equivalency between a minute and how many seconds is that? Or um, what if they asked you how many words per hour, right? So like, don't make it smaller, make it larger, right? If, if in 10 minutes you can do a thousand words, how much can you do in an hour? Well, 10 minutes is one sixth of an hour. So you could do um, the 10 minutes times six, that would give you 60 minutes that's an hour and then you need to multiply the other side by six and that's 6,000 words per hour. Now all of what I just said is purely mathematical okay but think about like the practicality of something like this who can really type you know at a at a consistent a consistently very fast speed you know for an entire hour who could sustain that um, you know so that's just a little you know a little extra something to think about there may be questions that you see in the future that ask you to evaluate the feasibility of something and how feasible is it for you to type you know 100 words a minute you might actually be able to accomplish 100 words per minute if you can type pretty fast but you know can you sustain that for a whole hour i mean it's not likely. I, I type very fast. My my word count per minute is like 120 or something like that. It's it's up there in that in that range. Um, but I know that if I tried to sustain that for like an hour, I don't think I could do it. That's that's a lot of typing. Okay. Um, okay. So so moving on, we're gonna do the last topic here. 
the last part of this section, which is topic four, operations involving mixed numbers. Now, I'm gonna draw a nice little line here because we are dividing our work here. We're just talking about topic four right now, operations with mixed numbers. The way that essential education explains this, I, I watched the tutorial, the video, um, I didn't love it. It seems um, like pretty complex. And me personally, I'm definitely a person who likes to take, like if I know how to do something another way that I already know how to do, why would I also teach myself this separate process to get to the same the same answer? That's not as efficient. I can only store so much information up here at a certain point, if I the more things I start adding, you know, the, the more things I'm gonna to have to forget in order to make room for this new information. So um, let me let me tell you, I'm gonna I'm not even gonna go over the way essential ed teaches you. There's a foolproof method that will work that you're already you're already doing it okay what you have to do is take your mixed numbers and convert them into improper fractions and then just go ahead and do whatever the operation is do the addition or subtraction or multiplication or division that's that's what we're talking about here we're we're adding subtracting multiplying or dividing mixed numbers and so the easiest way to do that would just be to turn them into improper fractions first and then do whatever the operation says. So let's do an example. The first one here is two and three fourths multiplied by one and one half. So let's convert these. So if you remember in the conversion, you multiply this and then you add this and you keep the same denominator, okay? So four times two is eight. Eight plus three is 11. That's your new numerator. And you keep the four denominator that's there multiply and then we're gonna do two times one plus one two times one is two plus one is three and that's gonna be the same denominator which is over two. Oh, let me roll this up so you can see this my bad oh I can't roll it up Uh oh okay because we're at the end of the document okay I just have to make sure I don't write any lower than that okay so now you have a problem that you've seen before and know how to do it's just multiplying fractions and you just go across the top and then across the bottom done Easy peasy. 11 times three is 33. Four times two is eight. The only thing I'm gonna look for is just if there's any type of common number between these two, a factor that I could simplify this. I, I don't think there is. 33 um, is like 33 and, and one or 11 and three. That's the only factors that are in that. So, um, and none of those factors go into eight. So that's that's it, this is the answer, okay? Now, they might ask you, a little caveat for you, right? They might ask you to express your answer at the end as a mixed number, but that's fine because we learned how to do that already, okay? Um, we're just gonna, we're gonna count how many times eight goes into 33 okay and it goes in four times eight times four is 32 so it goes in four whole times and then if you take eight times four and take it away from 33 what's left right so 33 minus 32 is one and you keep the same denominator so the answer as a mixed number is four and one eighth now just read your question read the directions carefully um you know, are they asking for a mixed number specifically? Or is it multiple choice and all the multiple choices are mixed numbers? Um, you know, that's that's how you can sort of, that's like a test taking strategy for you. Just what is the question expecting of you to give as an answer? If they want a mixed number, you're gonna have to convert it back. If they don't care, then leaving it as an improper fraction is, is fine. It's totally okay. Okay, last question. You are making a cake. The cake calls for three and a half cups of sugar, but you're on a diet, okay? Like we probably all need to go on because of quarantine. I know I do. You're on a diet and you wanna cut the sugar in half. How much sugar do you use? So you need to take three and a half cups of sugar. That's how much, that's how much all the sugar is supposed to be, right? And 
cut that in half. You need you need half that amount of sugar. That's that's what you decided to do. That's your accommodation for yourself to turn it into a bit healthier of a recipe. So let's express this as a mathematical equation. Um, that's going to be three and a half divided by two, right? Because you're cutting it in half. You want to see what it would be if it was two parts. So let's convert our, um, there's actually two things we need to do. We need to change this mixed number into an improper fraction. And then we also want to express two, the whole number two, as a fraction because that will just, it'll, it'll click for us to make this a little bit easier to look at. So um, two times three is six plus one is seven. That's seven over two. And how do we express two, the whole number as a fraction? Remember, any whole number can be expressed as a fraction. I'm gonna try and do that over here, right? So if you have a number, like, let's say the number is the letter B, we're just, B can be any number, any whole number, right? That is also expressed as a fraction as B over one, okay? So any whole number is a fraction. Oh my gosh, you're not gonna be able to see it. I'm gonna try really hard for you to be able to see this. Okay, let's see if I can roll that up. Apparently I just made it worse. As a fraction over one. Okay, I tried, I hope you can read that. Okay, so any whole number can be a fraction over one. That means we have two over one. Now, pause this video, okay, because what I just did with you was taking this word problem and turning it into a mathematical expression. I want you to pause the video and go find the rules for dividing fractions and figure this out. Okay, so remember with dividing fractions, we do keep, change, flip, or KFC, like the chicken place, right? That's what I always think of, K. CF, keep, change, flip. Okay, so keep seven halves, that's seven over two. Make it a multiplication problem and flip the second fraction so it's one over two, flip the numbers, okay? Now you just multiply across because it's, it's just a multiplying fractions problem. Seven times one is seven, two times two is four, that's it. So you need seven fourths cups of sugar to do this. Now. When do you ever go in the kitchen and measure something as seven fourths? Never, that doesn't make sense. You would never do that. You need to have this, this type of problem specifically, you, you really need to have this as a mixed number. Um, so how many times does four go into seven? It goes in one time, because if I did two, it would be eight, that's more than seven. I don't have eight parts, I have seven parts. So four times one is four, so that means it goes in one time, four times one is four. And how much more do I need to get to seven? I need three. So either one of these is an acceptable answer um, depending on what they want. If they want that to be a whole um, a mixed number then you need to convert it, it would be one and three quarters cups. If you are able to leave it as an improper fraction, seven fourths is a suitable answer. Okay, so here we are. Um, this is level M and it's lesson two, fractions, rates, and ratios. We've talked today about operations with fractions. We multiplied and divided. We learned about adding and subtracting fractions. We talked a bit about rates and ratios. And then we also did one last skill here, which was um, just how to work with these mixed numbers um, and do plus and minus, add and divide with those. Now, there is a Delta math assignment that I made for you guys that goes along perfectly with all the skills that we learned today. I want you to go ahead and make sure you sign into Delta math and give that a practice. And then um, if, you, if you need to do this topic in Essential Ed, make sure that you do log in and complete it. This lesson goes with that. You can wrap up that test and get that part over with. Um, you could also, if you're already beyond this, 
then the thing that you're going to want to do next is work in essential ed on just whatever level you're at um, and then we're, we're getting pretty close to being caught up to where you are tomorrow will be the third lesson um, inside of this topic which is about decimals and then we have one two three four more things to talk about inside of level m so that's like two more weeks and then we'll be on to level D, which is the next next one up. Um, and then finally, we can move on to level A. So we're, we're going to cover it all. We're going to get to everything. Um, so if you're already beyond this, hang in there. And if you, if, you, if you aren't beyond this and you need this right now, then do this. Go in Essential Ed. Bust it out. You can do it. And we're going to chug right along. Okay, so that's all I have for you in this lesson. I hope you enjoyed, and I will see you next time. Bye.